And so it's interesting. Roman soldiers would come home and they would say, hey, look at my scars. And they would like as as badges of honor. And so I think in some yeah. ways Paul is doing this. He's saying you're looking at your suffering as um, as a strike against you, uh, as as a blemish on your record uh, because people are rejecting you. But what does he say in Philippians chapter one, the end of chapter one? He says, you were given the gift, carizo, carizo which means given a gift, yeah. given a grace uh, of not only believing in him, but suffering for his sake. So they're saying, hey, Paul, we're suffering. He's like, great. I'm so glad you get that gift. And that's just not the way that we look at right. it today, right? Yeah. Hey everyone, welcome to Faith in the Folds, a podcast for ministry, biblical studies, and Christian living. I'm your host, Kevin Burr. Today I sat down with Dr. Nijay Gupta, professor of New Testament at Northern Seminary. Dr. Gupta is known for his work on Christian formation and his work on the life and writings of the Apostle Paul. Dr. Gupta has written commentaries on Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and separate works on the concepts of worship and sin in Paul's thought, as well as on the Sermon on the Mount and in general New Testament studies. I highly recommend his New Testament commentary guide, which helpfully directs students and other interested persons to navigate the potentially overwhelming mass of commentaries on the New Testament. You can find it on Kindle through Amazon. I was so thankful to Dr. Gupta for being able to talk with me about one of my favorite books of the Bible, Paul's short letter to the Philippians. I highly recommend Dr. Gupta's commentary on Philippians and the other commentary on Philippians he co-authored with New Testament scholar Michael Byrd. I know you'll be blessed by what Dr. Gupta has to say today. If you enjoy the kinds of conversations we're having here on the podcast, would you be willing to like and subscribe to us and maybe share us with someone who you think might benefit from this? And as always, thank you so much for tuning in today. Well, Dr. Gupta, thank you so much, sir, for joining us on the podcast today. I am excited to be able to talk with you about the book of Philippians, one of my favorite books in the New Testament. Appreciate you joining us today, sir. Hi, Kevin. Thanks. It's great to be here talking about one of my favorite texts. Yeah. So folks in biblical studies will probably be aware of your joint commentary with Michael Bird on Philippians, and you've written another shorter kind of uh, overview and theological approach to Philippians. But for folks outside of biblical studies, folks who don't necessarily have uh, formal training in, uh, in biblical and exegetical studies, help us get to know you a little bit more. How long have you been teaching? What are, like, where are you teaching? What's your dog's name? <laughs> just just help, help us kind of get to know you a little bit as we dig into this. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, so uh, I was born and raised in North Central Ohio. So I'm a, I'm a Heartland boy. Okay. Um, and I uh, went to Gordon Conwell for seminaries, the seminary associated with Billy Graham. Mm -hmm. uh, and I uh, did my PhD at University of Durham. Durham is famous for a couple things when I was there. One is N.T. Wright was the Bishop of Durham. If some mm -hmm. of your listeners know N.T. Wright and his work. Um, and if you're not an Entry Right fan, then you might be interested in knowing that Durham was a Harry Potter filming site for the first two movies. <laughs> and so there's even, I hear, cobwebs, fake cobwebs that were put into the cathedral that are still there. Still there. Um, yeah, but uh, I studied there for three wonderful years. My wife, Amy, and I uh, were there. We had our second child there. Uh, and then I've moved around all over the place, uh, you know, as kind of the itinerant, uh, you know, professor looking for work. Yeah. Uh, the, not quite panhandling, but uh, <laughs> but but definitely peripatetic uh, uh, traveling uh, traveling professor. So I've yeah. lived all over the place. I lived in Ohio. I lived in Philadelphia. I've lived in Seattle. I've lived in Rochester, New York. Um, wow. But right I now I live in Portland, Oregon, uh, and uh, been here for six seven uh, years. Um, my wife, Amy, uh, is uh, in ministry here in Portland. She's a youth pastor mm -hmm. at our church. Um, I've got three kids, uh, 15, uh, 12, and 10, and they're busy with sports and whatnot. Uh, I teach at Northern Seminary, which is kind of a little bit weird because I live in Oregon, but Northern is in Chicagoland. 
Uh, but uh, 21st century, it's not that strange to be teaching online over Zoom, yeah. like you and I, Kevin, are talking mm -hmm. right now on Zoom. And then I fly to Chicago every now and again to teach intensive. So I was just there actually teaching a class on Philippians as, hey. uh, as, as fortune would have it. Um, so, uh, my, my, you know, what I do in my own mind is I do, uh, I train and equip pastors to love scripture, to study it carefully and to learn how to help their people listen to God and be transformed, uh, by the gospel again and again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's great. That's, that's precisely the direction that, uh, that my seminary took. Um, you know, small seminary affiliated with my uh, church tradition in Memphis. And then, um, <clears throat> and really, uh, thankfully, my doctoral program um, there at Asbury with uh, guys like Greg Keener, Ben Witherington, mm -hmm. uh, other folks that, uh, that I mentioned before we started recording. So um, let me ask, before we actually get into kind of the heart of Philippians, what piqued your interest in Philippians? You've written, you've published on that, just taught on that. What, what is it about this short but <clears throat> powerhouse of a letter that initially drew you to it? Yeah, a couple things have always um, intrigued me. One is um, uh, Paul being in prison. And just I remember uh, St. John Chrysostom saying that um, Paul's prison letters are his most important letters because here he is kind of facing uh, possibly death. Mm -hmm. And so the deepest part of his soul is going to come out in these letters. And so it's funny, Chrysostom, who gets a little bit, a little bit exaggerated, but he talks about how precious those chains are, and he wish he could have those chains. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't quite go that far, but I do believe that um, when you're sitting in a prison cell, uh, wondering, you know, as he says in the letter, how it will go with me, right. um, you know, important things start to come out of your, of your pen and your heart and your soul. Uh, so I think that happens in that letter. Um, we know another part I love about the letter is, is he's really close with these people. Mm -hmm. um, he has a really close, intimate relationship. I don't think he had that with all churches that he was connected to, but with this church in particular, um, the Thessalonians as well, he, he they seem to be his friends. Like he, you know, he had a close relationship with them. Yeah. And um, that that's left an impact on me is just kind of seeing, you know, as I, I taught a course recently on Philippians and as I've, uh, converse with my students about this, um, they were kind of surprised to see a more tender hearted Paul because th they're used to hearing this image. That's doesn't make sense. They're used to, to being taught <laughs> it this image, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it this image of a, of a stern, cold, authoritarian doctrinaire Paul. And part of my ministry, part of what I'm fascinated with in Paul is that more personable, tender side. And then one of my favorite theological topics is cruciformity. You might know the work of Mike Gorman. Mm -hmm. uh, and and uh, I've been hugely influenced by Mike. I'm using the cruciformity as a textbook right now with my fall students. Uh, and um, Philippians chapter 2 has the so-called Christ hymn. I, t I talk about it as the ode to Jesus mm -hmm. because I see it as encomiastic, which is a great seminary word. And we'll yeah. talk about that later. But I see it as encomiastic, meaning it's an, it's an homage or, or a tribute uh, to Jesus and his way. Uh, and I think that's one of the most important passages in Scripture to help mm -hmm. us think about what it means to be a Christian, even in the 21st century, as we're thinking about power, money, economics, sociology, uh, value, how we put value on people. Uh, so there's so many reasons to love Philippians. I can't get enough of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I mentioned that phrase, ode to Jesus, uh, the other day when I was talking about, um, I think I was teaching a class here at church, and I mentioned that, you know, this, you know, the this, this scholar that I like named Nije Gupta, he describes this as an ode to Jesus, and I think that really makes, that makes sense. So yeah. and our folks here, at least, have heard you. And I there cited you, you. I think I think the other day, right? I asked you, like, how do you pronounce your name? Is it Nijay or Nijay? Because I was doing something for a group of missionaries from our church tradition who uh, are mainly uh, centered in Asia. It was an Asian missions forum, and I wanted to quote some things from you. So obviously, I've appreciated your Philippian stuff, and so this is this is a real treat for me. Thanks, Kevin. So, um, all right, so let's get into uh, some more of the more of the critical issues here. Philippians is, uh, I mean, we rightly call it a letter, but help us kind of understand sort of what does that mean and, and how does that work? And and if it's a letter, then what does, what does it tell us about how we should interpret this and, and read this? 
Well, you know, uh, it's really um, something we can identify with uh, is um, ancient people believe that being together was better than sending a letter. <laughs> Um, generally speaking, if you're really upset at somebody, you would just send a letter. But generally speaking, yeah. it's better to be together. And actually, I think Third John talks about this briefly. But um, uh, and Paul would have believed that uh, he talks about uh, wanting to see uh, the Philippians. He talks about in Philemon wanting to see Philemon. He talks about in the Romans wa wanting to go there to Rome. So he wants to be with his people. We understand that because right now, you know, we're saying we can't yeah. have an in-person conference with 8,000 people. Uh, so let's do it on Zoom or something. But then we say, wouldn't it be nice to be together? So we understand that. So we have to understand letters are in some ways a substitute for um, intimacy, being together, being in the same room, talking face to face, having a kind of living voice. Um, but Paul, uh, so Paul's letter writing ministry is a kind of concession. Uh, in most cases, he would love to be in the room with people. Um, but it's very interesting. I got this from a scholar named Eugene Boring. He says that uh, Paul's letter writing is an innovation in the sense that he is combining a kind of essay sermon with the genre of personal letter. Okay. Uh, and this is fascinating because even though people had sometimes done kind of uh, correspondences like Seneca like to do kind of professional correspondences with people that was more of the academic level and here Paul is writing to commoners yeah. and and he's infusing really personal letters with lots of detailed argumentation writing these really really long letters like Romans or first Corinthians oh, yeah. uh, and it, we don't take that as strange because we've had the Bible for 2000 years right but I, I like to communicate to students that the average ancient letter is about half a page so something so like you, the size of Philemon, right? Or Third yeah. John? Yeah, Philemon would be really good. Even shorter than Philemon, it's more yeah. to the point, like send me an extra pair of shoes. Uh, you know, Bonnie loves yeah. you from here and yeah. I hope you're doing well. The gods bless you, the end. Because yeah. this costs money. A lot of people weren't literate, uh, you know, that, that sort of thing. So uh, for Paul to write these really, really long letters, um, I think is a really interesting blend of teaching which can be very impersonal or professional and personal letter which is very intimate mm -hmm. you know he's saying very personal things in the letter he's referencing the people around him like timothy or silas uh he's referencing people there like he does at the end of many of his letters and so um when we're reading these letters we have to keep in mind number one uh this is an extension of his apostolic ministry I don't think he thought of his day job as letter writer, right? We, we talk <laughs> about Paul's a theologian. I don't think he thought about it. He, and he was an apostle. Um, so this is a, 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 a resource or a tool of his apostolic ministry. Number two, it's, um, it's a situational specific correspondence. Yeah. So it's kind of like when you're in the grocery store and you see someone talking to the watermelons and you're wondering what they're doing. And then you realize they have a Bluetooth in their <laughs> ear. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, okay, they're talking to somebody and you can kind of hear some things they're saying, but you're yeah. also wondering who they're talking to and about what. Uh, so when we read Paul's letters, we're kind of eavesdropping mm -hmm. on a conversation and Scott, part of a scholar's job is to try to figure out what's going on the other side of the conversation. Should we do a situational analysis as we might do with Philippians and figure out why is Paul saying, talking about suffering? Why is Paul talking about a change? Why is Paul talking about Yodi and Syntyche, these women that are talked about in chapter four? Why is Paul talk about beware of the dogs? I mean, there's just a, a whole host of conversations and questions we have about the situation. The better we can understand the situation, Kevin, the better we can uh, get to the heart of the text. Unfortunately, yeah. in some situations, I'm doing work on Philemon right now, we just don't know what the situation oh, yeah. is. It's yeah. really frustrating. Philippians, we have a few tent poles which help us. Yeah, I, I like tent poles. That, that's good. A little nod to uh, Paul, the tent maker. There, I like. There that. you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So we've we've got a, a letter here, right? Where Paul is not sitting down and thinking, okay, you know, two thousand years from now, folks are still going to be needing to read this. And um, I'm just going to pin out these thoughts and dash it away off to uh, off to this church here. He's actually responding to real felt needs there in the city, in the churches. Um, but we're kind of at a loss to some degree, trying to figure out what exactly is going on here. Um, I would I would think 
that that might should temper some of our dogmatism for saying, well, you know, absolutely, Paul meant this, this, and this, and we can know that for sure, because it says right here, it's like, well, we are missing a lot, but that doesn't mean that we can't know some things about Paul's letters. You mentioned the importance of suffering, mm -hmm. uh, which kind of runs through uh, not just Philippians, but also Second Corinthians. At the time of recording, the day earlier, I had recorded this uh, for the series, the episode on Second Corinthians with Fred Long. Mm -hmm. uh, professor of mine at Asbury, we had a great conversation about how Paul handles suffering. Suffering is a big deal in Philippians. Can we talk about that as one of these major themes? What is it about suffering that <clears throat> that Paul feels like he needs to mention or explain or or kind of help them work through there? Well, you have to understand that in the ancient world, um, the highest uh, priority for most people was honor. Mm -hmm. And honor was this kind of status-oriented perspective about how other people perceive you. Um, so, could, could you call of, it something like reputation? Reputation, status, okay. uh, honor, uh, and and it mattered, you know, um, how much money you had, what the, what you looked like, um, where you lived. You know, we can kind of understand this with like sure. postcode envy and things like that. But, you know, when you think, you know, just watching the Emmys or, you know, stuff on TV, like you think about people really concerned about how the news is going to portray them. Well, yeah. this was really important to people from the top of society to the bottom in terms of kind of rising in the ranks of status. And uh, so you take a city like Philippi, which uh, is a pretty, pretty prominent city in the ancient world. It was a Roman colony doesn't mean everybody was a Roman citizen, but it, it was a city that had a lot of um, uh, big business, high society, a lot of politics going on there. Mm -hmm. So people were, you know, there's one scholar named Joseph Hellerman who, who talks about how there's evidence that the city was very status conscious. Okay. And in that kind of environment, suffering is a no-no. You want to look like you have it all together. Hmm. You want to look like you're on the highway to success and fame and power. And so they have this thing in the ancient world, in the Roman world, called the cursus honora, which is the kind of route to success, the route to, to higher honors, Yeah, kind of the highway to, to honor. We might talk about it today <clears throat> as something like climbing the corporate ladder. Totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and so this was a thing in high society, but even in kind of what we think of as lower society, uh, they had versions of this as well. Mm -hmm. And so your goal day by day was to climb the ranks. And then here's what happens. Paul comes, he preaches the gospel, and then these these people that become believers accept the gospel thinking, my life's going to change. I'm going to have you know all these good things that that Paul promised. And then what happens? Paul lands in jail, and the Philippians are starting to get persecuted, pushed around by their neighbors. Um, there's a scholar named Peter Oakes, and he's written a really important uh, dissertation on this. I don't imagine that your listeners are going to go out and read it, although it's very readable. But he actually does these um, historical fiction scenarios of what people might look like in the church. Okay. So he has two people. One is a more elite, high society person named Penelope, and one is a more kind of, as we would think, a blue collar person named Jason. And, J and, he, and <clears throat> so this is fiction, but he imagines Jason is like, uh, let's say, like a baker. Okay. Uh, and and uh, works with a bunch of people in town in terms of delivering bread for their company or their restaurant. And now all of a sudden they find out that Jason follows this weird deity. Uh, and so they stop doing business with him and he kind of goes poor. Yeah. He's living kind of uh, on very little and he has to take up day labor. So when we talk about persecution, we're not talking about people calling you names on social media, even though that can be really... Uh, that, hurtful. that happened to me literally yesterday. <laughs> no, yeah. Well, that's, you know, that's a different kind of persecution. Yeah, yeah. But we're talking about real real life, money, uh, income, you know, relationships. I mean, uh, and so when we're talking about the Philippians experiencing suffering, this is a major blow to their desire to gain status, which was yeah. not just a personal thing, but it also meant uh, connections to uh economic opportunities, connections to business, connections to marriage. I mean, all kinds of stuff was was wrapped up in that. And then here the Philippians are, and they've wondered, have we bet on the wrong horse? Mm -hmm. Did we buy a gospel only to find out it was bad news? So in many ways, this letter is Paul 
teaching a different way to look at reality, a different way to look at the world, a different way to look at what God is up to, a different way to look at status and value. Chapter three talks a lot about value and worth. Um, rubbish, you know, everything I used to value yeah. now I consider rubbish. And what he's trying to do is he's trying to shift their thinking. There's uh, a term that he uses throughout the letter, which is a verb phroneo. So I use the, the English word phronesis. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite using the same way philosophers use it, but by phronesis, I, I mean kind of a comprehensive way that we look at how we live our life. Okay. Uh, kind of worldview kind of stuff. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and Paul wants to shift their phronesis. So they're thinking with and like Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating that this, uh, this notion of honor is, it's almost, it's almost hard to define initially, but I had a professor of mine in seminary talk about it in, in an academic sense. And then he actually had some, uh, some students come up to him later and say, well, actually, you know, I'm from, I'm from this neighborhood. I'm from this zip code. And in my minority subculture, I, we understand honor in a way that, um, that I think would really supplement what you've taught us from the ancient world. Um, one example, I, I don't, I don't know if you're a movie guy, but the Godfather, mm -hmm. well, like there's honor, there's, totally. yeah. you know, not, not in a Christian sense. Right. But there's, there's, you know, real a benefits to the honor and reputation that one has in the family and therefore in the community and things like that. And so you can kind of begin to see that, in some ways, I wonder, maybe this is another conversation for another time, but it, I wonder if majority American culture is gradually shifting towards kind of an honor shame culture and, and maybe social media is facilitating some of that. Uh, not, ne not necessarily entirely relevant for what we're doing today, but still, I think folks are beginning to kind of get a sense of this honor. And so, Go well, ahead, we get ahead. it. I mean, you think about a company, you know, an upstart company, um, you know, they're going to live and die by their reputation. I mean, yeah. if, if they get a lot of good ratings and reviews and things like that, like it makes a big difference. How is a new company going to make its way in the world uh, if they don't have like a, a major celebrity endorsement? They're going to do it based on just public opinion. I mean, you know, or think about a recall of a of a of a governor like in California. <laughs> I mean, the reputation, honor, you know, all this affects people's voting affects. So we, we have our own uh, way of looking at this. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So Paul is kind of helping them see, helping them, like you said, sort of reshape their worldview. Mm -hmm. Suffering in and of itself is not not dishonorable as they might think, right? Yeah, yeah. Suffering in this way of participating in Christ's suffering is actually the most honorable thing they can do. Is that, is that fair to, to, to describe it like this or Paul saying, really encouraging them to participate in Christ's suffering? Well, this is where the kind of transformation of their imagination or their or their worldview really matters because even in our day now, um, we have uh, noble forms of suffering. If you go mm. and you sit in a tree that's about to be cut down for 10 days to prevent it from getting, you know, chopped down, that's noble suffering, right? You're going to you know, you know, eat granola bars and, you know, get a 10 minute potty break every day or whatever. You like, live in Portland, right? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Yeah. Uh, so we, we understand the concept of kind of noble suffering and they sure. did in the ancient world as well. So I'm going to teach you just a little tool. You probably know this, but your listeners might not, but the, a little, a little, uh, uh, discussion in, in academics, uh, New Testament academics called physiognomy. Physiognomy is the idea that the way your body looks says something about who you are internally. Interesting. And whether we yeah. agree with that or not, this was common in the ancient world. So, for example, statues of Caesar, they would make him a little bit taller and they would get rid of any blemishes on his face or whatever. Wow. You know, they, they, uh, because they didn't want people to think that if he has blemishes yeah. that this must mean he's a less worthy person they didn't do much for his hairline i'll tell you that. no that they had different views of hairstyles <laughs> and things but uh but what's interesting from what we learn about uh for example scars is that scars on the front of your body were uh honorable especially for soldiers that would make sense yeah uh because you're fighting right yeah. 
And scars on the back of your body were dishonorable for two reasons. One is either you were captured and flogged mm -hmm. or you were running away. And so it's interesting, Roman soldiers would come home and they would say, hey, look at my scars. And they would like as as badges of honor. And so I think in some yeah. ways, Paul is doing this. He's saying you're looking at your suffering as um, as a strike against you. Uh, as as a blemish on your record uh, because people are rejecting you. But what does he say in Philippians chapter one, the end of chapter one, he says, you were given the gift, carizo, carizo which means given a gift, yeah. given a grace uh, of not only believing in him, but suffering for his sake. So they're saying, hey, Paul, we're suffering. He's like, great, I'm so glad you get that gift. And that's just not the way that we look at right. it today, right? Yeah. We have a hard time with that. And we think, oh, God, take away all my suffering. Mm -hmm. And God definitely doesn't rejoice in anyone's suffering. But we know what it's like to uh, to stand up for what we care about and are willing to experience difficulties because of that. Yeah. And, and even find value in that because, you know, we've chosen to do what's right. That's where Paul wants to take the Philippians. Yeah. I, ha I have not often prayed this prayer because I haven't been brave enough to pray this prayer very much. But in, in rare moments of clarity, I have prayed that, you know, I or the people around me, that we suffer well. Yeah. That we allow that suffering to be transformative. Yeah. Yeah. And Paul, and Paul says this in Philippians chapter four. He says, um, I've learned the secret. And what's funny, if you, and you know Greek, but, you know, English translations don't always capture this. He doesn't actually say what the secret is. <laughs> He and, and so I remember one of my one of my colleagues saying, doesn't he say contentment? He doesn't actually say contentment. We fill that in in the English translation yeah. because we think that's what he's talking about. And it may be, but he doesn't actually say what the secret is. He says, I've learned the secret of how to deal with suffering. And he doesn't actually say it is what it is. But what he means is deal with it. <laughs> I mean, basically he's saying <laughs> your life's going to have ups and downs. And the secret is knowing that. Mm hmm. Um, and I think there's power in that. There's power in knowing, you know, Paul saying my, my hope, my joy, my steadiness is not going to uh, be fully determined by staying up here in the echelon of abundance. Uh, I need yeah. to know low times, you know, are going to come and, uh, and, and to just be ready for that and realize that life is a roller coaster like that. And so it's funny. He says, I've learned the secret. He doesn't actually explain what the secret, what his, what his secret recipe is. So that list of uh, like list of rules for best business practices, right? <clears throat> you know, never tell rule number one. There's, I've got two rules for you. Rule number one, never tell everything, you know, Yeah. <laughs> and you just stop right there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. All right. So we're talking about suffering. Let's uh, let's transition a little bit to a very particular passage. Uh, this these verses in Philippians two, mm -hmm. where Paul s starts off. Actually, we don't need to start necessarily in verse six. We could start in verse one. There. Um, why does Paul give us this ode to Jesus? I, I, I'm almost I almost say ode to joy every time. Yeah, yeah. right. <laughs> that uh, this ode to Jesus here. Why does he start it off with a call to unity in the first uh, four or five verses and then give us this discussion, this beautiful section of uh, a very high Christology? Um, help us kind of work through what Paul is doing here in these verses, if you don't mind. Yeah, well, um, imagine the zombie apocalypse. So you're in the zombie apocalypse and you and your friends are in a house trying to survive the zombie apocalypse i'm going to tell you tech I, we're in we're in texas right now and um and i've got a tennessee flag behind me so that that's my roots i think we're going to be ready for the zombie apocalypse. you're going to be ready well okay then this is a real scenario for you yeah. so imagine it's zombie apocalypse you're in the house with 10 of your friends and you're deciding do we you know is this the last stand or do we try to go out and find other people you know what whatever um it's really stressful. You're really worried about what's going to happen out there and you don't, your clock is ticking. So what ends up happening? You start to fight amongst yourselves, right? And this is the kind of thing we're guessing was happening in the Philippian church. They're starting to experience external pressures. Mm -hmm. People are losing their jobs. People are saying, maybe this Christianity thing isn't for me. And you start then to have some infighting. And so if you think about it, like uh, uh, Paul uses militaristic language in this letter mm -hmm. of contending side by side, which gives you that image of like the soldiers standing kind of lockstep 
with their shields in formation to protect them, and people are breaking rank is the language we would use. Mm -hmm. And Paul is basically saying, uh, and so one of my, you know, in my, one of my books, I talk, I use the language of keep calm and carry on, uh, oh, yeah. which, which is that sense of hold the formation, hold the line. And so I think he's starting that way to say, um, once we lose our communal integrity, everything's going to fall apart. So mm -hmm. let's take a deep breath, keep calm, and let's turn towards one another rather than just be freaked out about what's going out on outside. So I think he starts that way. But but what, what, what really is happening is explained in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4. He says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Now, selfish ambition is an okay translation to translate the word into our time, mm -hmm. but uh, it literally means rivalry or okay. competi competitiveness, a spirit of competitiveness. Yeah. yeah. And so in the ancient world, you would compete with one another for honor. Mm -hmm. uh, honor was seen as a limited good, which means in order for me to go up in honor, someone else has to lose honor. Um, and so uh, it's natural then for people to start tearing one another down or complaining or, uh, and, and Paul's saying, you have to break out of that mindset. So imagine in your church, you're having a disagreement over um, changing the name of your church or what banner should go up in front of the church. Yeah. Right. And so you, and this, these are realistic problems that right, we have, yeah. right? So yeah. you have team, you know, team A, which is, you know, wanting this. What color this. is the carpet going to be? Yeah. And team B, <laughs> and yeah. in their worst moments, they start to gossip about each other. So, oh, you know, I saw Sally at, you know, oh, I saw Bob at this. So you start saying these things to undermine each other. Well, this is rivalry, right? This is spirit of competitiveness. Paul says, don't behave out of rivalry competitiveness. Don't behave out of, uh, you know, kind of pride. Yeah. But in humility, consider other better than yourselves. That's not a great translation. It really means lift up the other person and they will lift you up. Yeah. Um, and so then you're asking, why is he bring up the ode to Jesus? Mike Gorman talks about this as the master story of Paul's narrative spirituality. We might say Paul's theology, but uh, it's the master story. And um, there are stories in our life that are kind of at the heart of what, what we value. So it may be a story in your city. It may be, you know, Tolkien, people talk about Tolkien's Lord of the Rings as kind of the, the mythology of England. Mm -hmm. he, he made it up, right? But he said, you know, just like the Norse people have their own mythology, the Scandinavians, uh, you know, uh, we need our own mythology. Yeah. You know, a, 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 even if it's not true. Sure. Now, of course, Christians believe that Jesus is true, but this idea that a mythology uh, or, or you might say a foundational story in some way yeah. mm -hmm. uh, gets to the heart of who you are. Yeah. Paul wants that story to be not Octavian, uh, not, right. not Lord Caesar, not Zeus or Jupiter, um, you know, not any of the local Philippian popular deities, uh, not some military hero, but Jesus. Yeah. And if Jesus's story becomes that master story that really says who we really are, um, what that Philippian Christ hymn or, or Ode to Jesus is all about is Christ's, you know, I, I boil it down to two things. Uh, the Son of God's obedience to the Father, no matter what the consequences, and his love and care for others. Now, the love and care for others isn't explicitly stated there, but it's kind of implied in chapter sure. two in general. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but this idea of, uh, you know, a, a mindset of humility because my life is not about me. It's about obeying the father and serving my neighbor mm -hmm. uh, and, and uh, sa you know, giving myself to serve my neighbor. Um, that's what Paul wants to communicate. And th th so that becomes kind of the center of gravity for the whole letter. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, as you're walking through that, I, you know, just quickly, I was kind of reviewing, it's like, all right, what are some of the stories that I had, that really helped give me an identity, right? Is, is that a, is that a fair, kind of a fair way to put that? Yeah, um, narrative identity. Yeah, and like, you know, I start thinking about your family name and stuff because we're, we're teaching our five-year-old, he's in kindergarten, we're teaching him, so, hey, you know, here's how you spell your name, all right, here's your first name, um, all right, here's your last name, you know, this is kind of 
kind of why this is how all this works, right? Everybody has a, most everybody has a first middle and last name. My dad doesn't have a middle name. He likes to say that his family was too poor. They didn't, couldn't afford one, which, which is a dynamite dad joke, right? Um, <laughs> but he, uh, but this, this notion of these are the stories that help give me some sense of identity reminded me of some work that I've done in in this in the city of Philippi proper, um, I, I presented in a couple of smaller venues a paper on God Most High in Acts 16, mm -hmm. and so I had to do a lot of work with inscriptions. And there's a German-speaking mm -hmm. scholar named Peter Pilhofer who has yep, done a yep. lot of work in in the Latin and Greek inscriptions of the city of Philippi. And what's fascinating is you don't even have to read German; you could just read the translations of these inscriptions. And there, you know, inscription after inscription has everybody's title for, you know, they're part of this club, they're yep, part yep. of this, you know, this tribe, yeah. tribe, or they're part of this, you know, as, association that meets once a month to <clears throat> you know, provide a potluck meal. And, you know, we're going to help bury these guys when they die because it burial is expensive and stuff like right, that. Right. What's fascinating is, in many of those, everybody has some kind of title. They have some kind of identity marker of here's your here's your special spot in the totem pole. And the top folks are always up at the top. It's not alphabetical order. You know, the, the most honorable are up at the top. That's fascinating to see. Like that's just that's a real world example of mm -hmm. these folks that had some some little identity marker. And Paul is driving them. It's like, you know, all of this pales in comparison. Yeah. All of this pales in comparison, really driving them towards, towards Jesus. As, that was just, as, as soon as you mentioned that, I was like, okay, yeah, there's a whole host of ways that this was very concrete, you know, <laughs> chiseled in rock, literally, for, for a lot of these folks. As Paul kind of swings up, from this emptying of christ right in technical terms it's called the kenosis of christ mm -hmm, mm -hmm. there in this uh, section chapter 2 6 through 11 what is paul trying to show the believers by showing christ's upward movement is he is he trying to show them that they participate in that kind of upward movement as well yeah so so this is you know there are two parts to the philippian uh, uh christ him or ode uh, one is, you know, so it's sometimes called a V-shaped story because you have this condescension or self-lowering mm -hmm. uh, down to, you know, Paul says, you know, became like a slave and and, and a slave. Uh, Jesus wasn't a slave, so it's a metaphor, but a right. slave is a nobody in society. Um, one one scholar I've been reading, uh, Laura Nasrallah, she refers to a Roman view of slaves as slave things, their possessions. Yeah. And so it becomes like a slave. So that kenosis, I... I People want to say he made himself nothing, uh, and it's hard to explain what that means uh, in terms of substance. Uh, but I'd rather say he made himself a nobody. Yeah, uh, that gets like closer that. to the sociological dimension of referring to him as a doulos, which means slave. And, and so, that's probably a better way to look at it, right? Paul isn't talking. Paul isn't necessarily trying to hint at the at the the technical details of the metaphysical yeah yeah not. metaphysical yeah metaphysical or ontological details yeah, he's not he's not and and there are you know places we can talk about that sure. in first corinthians and whatnot but it's not really he doesn't lose his godness uh in that mm -hmm. i think of it kind of like the story of the prince and the pauper uh when the prince uh becomes a pauper he's no longer a prince it's not that he's no longer a prince he just appears to be a pauper yeah uh and and so uh that's you know there's great language of visualization form scheme schema uh anyway this lowering become nothing what happens in the second part with the resurrection uh i get this from a scholar named lou martin uh j lewis martin uh who has this line that has always stuck with me since seminary he says just because the resurrection comes after the cross doesn't mean it replaces it and by that yeah, he like and that. by that he means the resurrection is not a reversal of, of what Jesus did on the cross. It's God's stamp of approval that what Jesus did was right. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And uh, I was in the production of Godspell in high school, uh, one of my uh, just after I became a Christian. So it was pretty amazing. And uh, I, I believe the original ending of Godspell, which is based on, I think, the Gospel of Matthew, uh, has Jesus die and not raise again from the dead. And I think the, the, the writer chose to do that because um, it's too easy. It's too easy of an ending. For yeah, everything I, I to think be, I understand that. Yeah, given to the, be so, to, given the artistic license, sure, I, I think I understand yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying that's the way Matthew right, should have yeah, ended. Yeah, I'm just yeah. saying, um, uh, the way the musical ends is G they carry Jesus's body out and they sing "Long Live God," and um, what I like about that is really pausing to appreciate the great sacrifice of Jesus that isn't done away with by the resurrection. It's not an unraveling of all of that. So what the resurrection is, I believe Jesus really rose from the dead, obviously. But uh, what the Christ hymn really says to the Philippians is, if you follow this pattern of cruciformity, which means becoming like, uh, becoming like Jesus, which Paul actually says in Philippians 3, becoming like him in his death, mm -hmm. having fellowship with his suffering, so, how to, so, so somehow to experience resurrection from the dead, he's saying... Um, uh, you will be vindicated. It may not happen right away. It may not happen tomorrow. It may not happen 10 years from now. It may not happen 50 years from now. But God knows what you've done. God sees what you've done. And there's a there's a kind of a sermonic line I use with students. Uh, what is right will come to light. I like that. Um, and so when we think about eschatology, which is what God's going to do in the future, and when we think, okay, I'm going through this suffering for the sake of the gospel, I'm uh, I'm giving up things for the sake of the gospel, just like in the gospels, as Jesus says, God will give you back double, you know, what you gave up in this world. Mm -hmm. um, this is, I think, Paul's way of doing that. He's saying, you're going to take some gut punches for yeah. the gospel. You might lose your house. You might lose your relatives may never speak to you again. Now, that's not what Paul wants. That's not what Jesus wants uh, in terms of just for everyone to be going through suffering. But this idea that there's hope that what is right will come to light. Um, I like to use an example from Job. Job talks about, you know, woe is me. He's suffering. And he says, uh, would, would that I would lay down with kings and counselors. Uh, and he means, I, I wish I were dead. Mm -hmm. But from our modern mindset, we think he just wants to end his pain. But if you take a, a, a honor shame perspective, He's not just lying down. He's lying down with kings and counselors. Yeah. So that means that in the afterlife, so to speak, his honor, will, his true honor will be restored. Mm -hmm. uh, to lay down with kings and counselors means he's in, he's, he's put in the right category. He's in the in company the of, of these honorable folks. That's right. Yeah. And, and I think Paul is saying that he's saying there's a kind of invisibility to your honor and reputation mm. that you just have to live with as a part of being part of this new kingdom community yeah. and those people that you once upon a time said i want to get in their good graces i want access to their clubs mm -hmm. i want invitations to their dinner parties he said you're not going to get it but you get invited to jesus's dinner party and it's a lot better <laughs> and it lasts a lot longer <laughs> it lasts a lot longer so it is it is really a changing of the way we look at yeah. self-worth value status that doesn't mean we're jerks. Some people take this and they say, oh, screw the world or, you know, be mean to your neighbor in the name of Jesus. That's not what Paul is saying. Yeah. Some people take it that way because they want to have this us versus the world. Mm -hmm. um, Paul talks in in uh, in chapter three, I think, in Philippians about uh, 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 gentleness, kindness to everyone. Yeah. Epi a case, which some, one translation says sweet reasonableness. So we need to have a sweet reasonableness. Uh, magnanimity is another translation. Yeah. When we engage with the world, um, all the while knowing too, though, that if they say no to us, it's not the end of the world. I think yeah. that's what he's saying in the second part of that. Ode. Yeah. Some people are are not persecuted because they're Christians. They're just persecuted because they're jerks. That's yeah. that's, that's a sad uh, reality, but it's a reality. One more comment on on that, and then uh, let's move to um, some things in in chapter four, if you don't mind. Um, I, I I'm confident that I was not the first person to come up with this, but I came up with 
I saw these connections independently and I want to see if, if, if this at least makes sense or maybe is a, if a fair way to kind of present these things. I, I can't help but wonder if Paul is reflecting on his time in the city of Philippi, which we read about a pretty short account of in Acts chapter 16. Mm-hmm. And then Paul is noticing that you know, as he's uh, as he's preaching, as he exercises the you know the Python spirit from this enslaved uh, young girl there, and uh, the crowd attacks them, and um, <clears throat> they end up getting put in jail. Only later for Paul to be vindicated, not just by the jailer, but also by the essentially the mayor of the town. Yeah, I can't help but wonder if Paul maybe sees himself mirroring to a smaller degree what he presents Jesus doing in chapter 2, Philippians 2, verses 6 through 11. Is, is, that, is that a fair comparison to say that these two things could kind of map on to each other, at least to some degree? Um, maybe, but but but... I think the punchline in Philippians is Paul's in prison and he might die. So he says in chapter one, uh, Christ will be magnified in my, in my body, whether mm-hmm. by life or death. Yeah. And so I, I, I don't think this is where we're going with this, but I don't want to give people the impression that um, you're going to get what you want out of a, uh, out of a boxing match with the magistrates <laughs> because yeah. of the Christ him. In fact, yeah. quite the opposite Paul's saying, I think the point he wants to make is you may glorify Jesus by your death. Mm -hmm. And actually, he actually doubles down on that in chapter two, verses 19, uh, 18, 19, where he says, even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I'll rejoice. What he's saying is I might die and you need to be okay with that. Yeah. He's saying the gospel won't be lost. The church won't be lost. Um, there's a great line from a Coldplay song, which I forgot to mention to my students, but it's it's really helped me with Philippians. Just because we're losing doesn't mean we're lost. I like that. And that's a pretty good tagline for Philippians. Uh, mm. You know, you look at the scoreboard and it looks like we're losing, mm. but we're not lost. Yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, uh, Paul, I think that's what Paul's saying. And so whether or not people will succeed um, in, in getting their freedom from jail or winning, a you know, a battle of some kind, um, Paul's not too concerned with that. I think his bigger message is, uh, we do, uh, so, you know, you know, I have young kids when I quote frozen to, uh, <laughs> do the next right thing, right? That's what yeah. he's saying, you know, keep care, keep calm and carry on. He says, mm-hmm. whatever the, whatever the physical outcome do the next right thing. And if you don't get paid in this world, uh, and, and Paul's saying, you know, look at my chains. Yeah. So, I, uh, then, you know, you'll get to, you'll get to lay down with Kings and counselors. And, yeah. um, there's something, uh, there's something powerful about that. I mean, I, I hate to politicize, but I think of like Nelson Mandela, you know, someone who's, you know, sat in a jail cell for how many years, you yeah. know, you know, and what do you do in those circumstances where you're thinking, you know, how did this end up for me? Um, uh, and that sort of thing. So, um, I'll have to think more about the Acts connection, but, but yeah. the big message in Philippians is come what may. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Yeah. I don't think the Acts connection, right. It's, it's not a perfect analogy, but from a, from at least a, a sermonic point of view, I, I, I could see how there's some semblances and for mm-hmm. Paul in that instance in Acts, it, you know, there was, there was a pouring out and there was an exaltation, but like you correctly mentioned, that very well could not be the case. Yeah. You know, it says in verse, it says in 121 for me, well, to live is Christ, but to die is actually better. Yeah, right. To die is gain. Yeah. Talking about this, this is a, this is a perfect segue. So does Philippians 4.13 therefore mean that i can win football games <laughs> <laughs> if you pray hard enough no sure. yeah um sure. you know it should be obvious in the context of paul being in prison mm-hmm. that 
he can't just pray it away, nor does, in fact, his bigger point is God is doing amazing things in the midst of failure and weakness and suffering. Oh, yeah. And so he's saying, um, you know, actually the gospel has advanced through these chains. He mentions that in chapter one, you know, all of Caesar's household, right? Which is a, a yeah. great statement. Yeah. So when he says, I can do all things, he's really saying, I can endure all things. Mm. Uh, I can live with whatever uh, bad circumstances that I have found myself in. So it's much closer to the it is well with my soul him than it is to the great posters of, of you know, sports fame uh, that want to use that as some kind of headline for that. Now, I love the line from William Carey, um, attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. I'm all about attempting sure. great things for God. Yeah. But might you and I have uh, a, a, a humble ministry of sitting in a prison cell, you know, you know, trying to share Jesus with fellow prisoners and guards? Yeah. Um, Paul sees that as also a part of of uh, doing all things, and so we have to be careful of the individualistic um, sort of. It's that big question, Kevin, which I'm sure that, you know, that, that you've tried to encourage people to think about. It's that big question of, is God in the business of making my life better? Or is God in the business of teaching me how to be uh, a faithful contributing member of the, the gospel mission, uh, which involves great joy of fellowship? And as Paul says in chapter two, verses one through three, uh, he says, or sorry, verses one to two says, haven't you experienced the compassion of God, the fellowship of the spirit, you know? So, so there's lots of great stuff with being yeah. a Christian, but getting what you want is really not one of them. Uh, and so, uh, yeah. Every day might not be a Friday. <laughs> yeah, you know? that's right. And some Fridays may be bad. Um, so, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just share just briefly with you that, um, my daughter had cancer ages one to three. She's perfectly healthy now, but, um, and we prayed and prayed and prayed for it to go away and this and that and the other, and, and she's cancer free now, which is a great answer to prayer. Mm -hmm. But at no point did we think, um, that God was pulling strings up in heaven, giving people cancer or taking away cancer, just yeah. kind of willy nilly. Mm -hmm. Um, our mindset was on, um, uh, how grateful we were for the compassion of the church. Mm -hmm. buying us groceries, buying us cleaning products, yeah. um, God's grace in charities supporting us um, and helping us with bills, uh, God's grace in having great doctors and nurses. And uh, even though our prayers for her healing were important uh, and essential for our well-being and her well-being, um, God was doing so much more than just taking away cancer. Yeah. I don't say that tritely. I, you know, cancer is a really horrible thing. Yeah. Um, but, uh, um, you know, my daughter, uh, you know, for all the horror of that, we wish it never happened. Um, we see a real depth of her personhood, even as a 10 year old. Mm -hmm. uh, I deal with chronic illness, uh, pretty severe sometimes. And uh, would I love for it to just go away like that? Absolutely. Sure. It would be really nice. But Paul's message in Philippians is um, God does really amazing things in the midst of these circumstances that that make us deeper people, and um, and and give us a, a special ministry to those who are in suffering. And so I can I can minister to people going through chronic suffering in a way that other people can't, yeah. and my daughter can minister to people going through uh, severe illness in a way other people can't. And so um, when I think about Philippians 3 or 4 and what you're talking about, um, it's sad to me that people might use that to, 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 to kind of pray away uh, all their problems mm -hmm. uh, in the name of some sort of big faith. Uh, I remember C.S. Lewis writing uh, a book called Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer. The funny thing is, I, after, only after I read the book did I realize there's no actual Malcolm. It's a fictionalized correspondence <laughs> between he and his colleague. But they talk about prayer and his, Malcolm kind of asks him, um, what does what does Jesus mean? He says, if you have faith as you know, as small as much seed, you can move mountains. He said, do you, you know, do you have mountain moving faith? And I remember Lewis says, um, uh, 
uh, that's the copping stone, which means that's the summit of faith. Like who can, who's sufficient for that? He says, I'm still at thy will be done. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think about that uh, when I think yeah. about the verse, I can do all things. Lewis would say, that's the copping stone. That's like, you've reached a mountaintop. I've been able to, to experience that. He said, and I say with him, I'm still at thy will be done. Hmm. Yeah. Nijay, as we wrap up this morning, let me ask, what is your favorite or one of your favorite passages from Philippians and, and why? Um, lately, I have been doing a lot of reflecting on what Paul says in uh, chapter four about uh, anxiety. You know, it's, it's interesting. He says, you know, do not, uh, do not worry. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he talks about um, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is noble, you know, meditate on these things and practice them and so forth. Um, I, I remember studying this for my commentary and that that language about whatever is excellent, praiseworthy. I was trying to find different language for that um, praiseworthy in particular. And I landed when I created my own translation, I landed on the word the spectacular. Yeah. And um, during our pandemic, you know, we're all experiencing some form of anxiety, some mm -hmm. form of worry and stress, right? And I'm just amazed how much Philippians resonates with our moment of yeah. literally people get sick with worry. They literally yeah. get sick with worry. I, I've had issues with anxiety and I've seen, I've gotten some help with that. Um, but part of Paul's advice is um, now he's in prison. So he doesn't say this in any sort of, you know, uh, superficial way, but he says uh, we need to be on the lookout for God doing the spectacular around us and it can be in little things it can you know i talk about it that passage is not about virtue as much as aesthetics uh which is about mm -hmm. seeing excellence so seeing excellence in my daughter playing soccer and just really enjoying that moment sitting there and really enjoying watching her as a 10 year old play soccer mm -hmm. or sitting at a restaurant and really sitting down with your food and really just enjoying the artistry that went into someone making that rice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're a pastor, you're with someone that's, you know, do, does woodworking, really enjoying the artistry that went into that. Um, that doesn't wipe away anxiety and stress, but it does help us to be on the lookout for God's grace as we see beauty and excellence around us. And that these are ways that we can see God at work, even in the midst of great uh, difficulty. Yeah, yeah. Nijay, this has been a treat. I, I, I thank you so much for for your time. Um, I will be sure to include in the description links to um, a couple of commentaries that you've written. Um, are, are there some other? Are there some other things or, or ways that folks can kind of kind of follow your stuff if they if they want to keep up with you? Yeah, definitely. So I have a blog called Crux Sola, which is Latin for the cross alone. Okay. It actually comes from Luther. But if you just Google my name, you'll come across my blog. I do want to mention uh, this relates to Philippians, but um, uh, we just announced a tribute to Scott McKnight that we published I with saw that, uh, yeah. Cascade Wiffenstock. It's called Living the King Jesus Gospel. Mm -hmm. Uh, essays and reflections on ministry uh, and Christian discipleship. Um, I wrote a chapter on Philippians. Uh, and so, uh, uh, you know, might be interesting to check that out. I look at Paul's use of uh, citizenship language in Philippians, which we didn't get a chance to talk about, but it's really interesting. He uses the language of uh, being a good citizen and, and being a part of the heaven, com heavenly commonwealth. Mm -hmm. And really, pastors don't know what to do with this because you don't want to say pie in the sky kind of stuff, but I, I actually walk through what Paul's talking about. So check out that book, uh, check out Scott McKnight's stuff. But, um, but, but this just was announced on Monday, the, the September 20th, living the King Jesus gospel. Yeah. I'm really proud of this book. I'm one of the editors and, uh, we got to surprise Scott with it recently. So it was super fun. Yeah. So you mentioned the date of that. I, I, I said, I saw that yesterday on, uh, on Facebook. That was actually at the time of recording, that was literally the day before it's like, we're right. recording on Tuesday, September 21st. <laughs> this episode won't debut, I think, until sometime in November. Sure. But sure. then we'll have um it's like that that's that's pretty neat. As soon as I saw that, I I thought to myself, Scott McKnight's not old enough to have a fest shrift. <laughs> He's not old enough to have 
<laughs> something like this. Don't he, tell you know, him I said he, that. He is he is a person with a lot of energy and a lot of industry. Um, yeah. But a bunch of us, uh, Matt Bates, Drew Strait, me and Tara Beth Leach, we just sat around and said, uh, it's a good time to celebrate Scott, whether or not whether or not he's going to retire for 10 years, <laughs> 20 years, 50 years. Yeah, it's a good time to celebrate him. In fact, he texted me and said, <laughs> is there something I don't know? Like we're forcing him into retirement. <laughs> if we're gonna but, retire. Um, but I, you know, just I recently wrote a tribute, uh, edited a tribute to Mike Gorman, uh, who I just mentioned. It's, yeah. it's called Cruciform Scripture. As I was thinking about the people that have shaped my life deeply in terms of discipleship, uh, Scott's Scott's top level uh, right. in the, on that list, and so uh, so I just get a kick out of celebrating people and and making sure other people do too. So check out yeah. that book. All right, Dr. Gupta, thank you so much for your time, sir. Really appreciate you having you on the podcast today. Absolutely, good talking to you, Kevin. Bye bye.